Welcome to the Jongas Games update vlog for September 2022. As you can see, there's a few things I'll be talking about today. And before we go into those, I would like to mention that there is an audio version of this episode that you can listen to instead of watching it. Now, that is an exclusive perk from backing the Patreon campaign for the channel. You can learn more about that by going to patreon.com slash Games. There's a bunch of other exclusives you can gain access to as well. Uh, for example, I just put an opinions episode out this morning to the Patreon backers where I discussed eight games that I played over the last week. Five of those were new, and I just go into a lot of depth about the things I like and dislike about all the games that I'm playing, and I've now discussed over 150 games in those exclusive opinions episodes. There's other perks like, of course, gaining access to an exclusive podcast feed where you can hear audio versions of vlogs like this one, and you can watch some videos early and advertisement free, and I'd really appreciate your support if that's something you'd like to do. Now, at this point, I'd like to move into the general updates for the channel, and in particular, we're going to start with the Game of the Month segment. Uh, this is something I started a few months ago, and it's all about talking about, well, the Game of the Month for the last month. You know, I looked at all the games that I played, and in particular, there were 28 different games that I played, and I discussed each one of these in exclusive opinions episodes, and I tried to consider um, how much I enjoyed them, how many times I played them. Uh, I'm still not exactly sure what my framework is for picking what the Game of the Month is. Um, I thought about this quite a bit. Um, just going off of like raw fun and time spent having fun, I strongly considered making Carnegie the game of the month. Um, but I've done that before, and I'm not really sure if I want to double up. Like, I'm not sure if that's an okay thing or not. Maybe it is. I mean, this is just a thing that I'm doing. Um, ultimately, looking at all these games that I played, I decided to just go with the one that felt like the game of the month for a reason that I might not even be able to put into words. And uh, because of that, I decided to go with a game called Dickory. Now, um, before I discuss that one a little more, I do want to give some uh, runner-ups. Uh, obviously, Carnegie is right up there. Um, and there's another couple that I really liked, but I only played them once, so I'm not sure where they're going to fall. One of those is Hachi Train, and another one is uh, Trick and Trade. They're both surprisingly hard to acquire Japanese card games. One's a shedding game and one's a trick-taking game. I've only played each of those once, but I'm really looking forward to playing them more. As far as other runners-up, um, Village Rails was a whole bunch of fun, and Mask Ben is a super cool card game that came out like 10 years ago that I played a couple of times that was in the running. But ultimately, I decided to go with Dickory. Now, this is a funky game because it's not actually published to the point where you can go to a store and buy it. This is a game that came out last year, and one of the two designers for this is the same designer as Haggis, which is a card game that came out well over 10 years ago that you might have heard about. Now, Dickory is a game that you can play with a standard deck of cards. And in fact, if you go to the Board Game Geek page for Dickory, you can go to the forums and there's a living rules document because I think they might be maybe subtly making changes. I don't know. It seems like the game is done as far as I can tell, but maybe they're helping with the wording and whatnot. But this is a game that anybody can play with a standard deck of cards. And that's part of the reason why I want to talk about it because I really enjoyed playing this game. Uh, as far as uh, going from zero to super excited, uh, this was the fastest that I did last month. A few weeks ago, in the last month, I had the great opportunity to just hang out with one of my oldest friends and play games for two days straight. It was largely just two players. He took a couple days off work, and I did too. And I brought a suitcase of games. We went traveling for this. And uh, despite the fact that I had a suitcase full of all these games I wanted to teach them, earlier in the day that I went to go play those games, I learned about Dickory. I uh, read the rules, and then when I got there, the very first game that we played was Dickory. <laughs> So again, my excitement level for all these games in the suitcase that I brought um, didn't trump my excitement level for this game that I had just learned about. And this is a funky game where you're just trying to get rid of cards. It's a card shedding game, um, kind of like Teach You and various other games, but that's probably the most famous one. And I really enjoy card shedding games. But the reason this game really jumped out to me once I learned it, and like I have to play this as soon as possible, I'm going to play this in a couple of hours, is because you have these cards, and they go from 1 to 12, and they're tied to a clock, which I think, you know, Hickory, Dickory, Dock, the... That's all I know about that. But I know that there's a clock um, in that uh, rhyming verse. And um, you have this clock, and you essentially change the power of the cards based off of where the mouse is on the clock. Um, I have a graphical image that you can see, and I'm using a, a Stick'em deck, uh, also known as Stitch Elm. Uh, the reason for that is because that has numbers going from 0 to like 14, so 1 to 12 worked. Although, again, you can use a standard deck of cards. Um, you just need to use like an ace for the 1, and then like the jack and the queen for the 11 and the 12. It totally works. But in this game, you're just playing cards from your hand, um, either runs or sets of cards. But the strength depends on the farthest 
furthest right card in this splay of cards in the middle of the table. So if the uh, three, for example, is farthest to the right, then three is the strongest card. And you can kind of visually imagine a clock or look at a clock on the table. Also, there's a nice web app that somebody made um, that you could just use your phone and there's print and play. There's lots of ways to put this clock on your table. But anyway, if the three is the strongest, then um, the three beats the two, two beats one, and one beats 12. In fact, the weakest card is a four when the three is the strongest. You kind of look at the clock to see that strength level. And when it's your turn, you either play cards to beat your opponent, or you could take cards from that tableau and then play cards to beat your opponent, or you can pass and that just ends the round. Now, the real awesome part of this game is taking those cards from uh, the tableau because when you take cards from the middle, you change what the rightmost card is. So by taking a card into your hand, now suddenly maybe a seven is the strongest or maybe a, a 10 or something really different from a three, and that can totally change the structure and the power level of your hand. Now, this game is all about just getting rid of cards. There's no points or anything. It's also, I should have mentioned this earlier, a two-player only game. And um, you just want to be the first person to play all your cards, and then you win. So it's kind of counter to the point of the game to draw cards into your hand because your hand is getting bigger. But you might be drawing cards into your hand to then make the cards that you already had stronger. You might be able to build into a set or just make these cards um, stronger based off of what the new number is. You know, if you had a four in your hand, it was awful. But if you take some cards and now the uh, six is the highest card out there, Suddenly, a four is the third to strongest value out there in the game, and you can play that one out, and now your opponent has to deal with it. So you play through multiple of these rounds uh, until you go through the whole deck, and then you don't reshuffle. You just keep going until somebody plays all of their cards. And this game has really captured my attention. Um, I wouldn't say it's the absolute best game that I played over the last month, but I will say that um, I've played it six times, teaching it to three different people. And each time I played it, we've played it twice back to back. This game is pretty quick. It takes maybe 15 to 20 minutes, I guess maybe 10 to 20 minutes, depending on how quickly you're able to get all those cards out. So playing a couple games back to back makes sense. But from a excitement perspective of just wanting to show this cool, shiny thing to people, um, I decided this was going to be my pick for the month. Again, if I was to go off of strict amounts of fun or uh, maybe even just complexity of, uh, of rules or, or just other metrics, I might have picked other things. But I just wanted to talk about this game more than all the rest. So I figure that's going to do it. Um, also, I think it's pretty cool that there is this super smart, super fresh, really easy to teach game that everyone can play as long as they have a standard deck of cards. I just think that um, it's cool. Like you don't have to go buy a game to try this one out. It's likely you could play this one right now. Um, it is two player only, which means, you know, you could only play it with one other person, but I frequently find myself in situations where I could play a, a, a two-player only game. And obviously, when I had my little two-day crazy mini card game convention with my friend, um, it was just the two of us. So that was part of the reason why this was the first game that I wanted to play there. Um, later on, when we discussed uh, with my friend, like the games that he enjoyed um, that I was teaching him, this was one of the games that he enjoyed the most. He did specifically say he liked Carnegie the most of the games that I taught him. So again, Carnegie just keeps floating up to the top. It really is up there in contention. Maybe it's just like a Hall of Fame game at this point already. Um, it really is an exceptional one. But yeah, either way, I, I could probably rattle on about Dickory even more, but I should probably just close this out by saying if this sounds even remotely interesting to you, try it. You know, go to the Board Game Geek page. Uh, again, th the rules aren't in the files section. You have to go to the forums, I think the rules section of the forums, and you can find a link to a Google Doc that is the current best version of those rules and give it a shot. I, I strongly recommend it. I don't think it's necessarily going to blow you away and be the best game you've played this year. Year, but I found it fresh, I found it interesting, and very enjoyable. Obviously, playing it six times in a month is, is certainly saying something, even though it is a pretty quick game to play. So yeah, that is going to bring the Game of the Month segment to a close. And now, I only have one other update, and it's pretty simple. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the last month. I don't have anything big to announce or anything. Uh, as I mentioned, I had an amazing time playing just a slew of games with one of my best and oldest friends. So um, that's always, you know, kind of a plus on the month for sure. Um, and also, as part of that, Jess and I went on a trip. We were gone for about nine or so days. And it was a kind of a working trip. I, I did a bunch of work while I was uh, gone as well. But it did mean that, you know, the video output was a little bit lower. I, for the second month in a row, did not do a live questions and answers vlog. Part of the reason for that, well, the main reason was because <laughs> I guess I decided I didn't want to. It was easy to not do it. I said I was going to do it on a Monday. I forget which day it was. And then our traveling plans changed, and we were actually driving 500 miles on the day that I was going to be doing that. So obviously, I wasn't going to make it. So I was like, okay, we'll just do it later on in the week. Well, 
then I got home and, you know, I didn't get as much work done as I really wanted to while I was gone, so I felt like I really needed to focus on other things. And long story short, I just kind of put it off to the point where I just didn't do it. And it has me thinking that I certainly want to keep doing these live q and I'm not going to stop doing them, even though I have somehow gone two months without it. But I think I'm going to not say a specific day and time. I think calling that out so many weeks in advance is maybe not working for my schedule right now. I mean, it's worked for several years, but, you know, seeing a pattern of missing it two months in a row makes me feel like maybe I should try to be a little bit uh, looser with it. So I'm definitely going to try to do one. I'm going to talk about that more in the schedule later on, but I think I might just target a week that I'm going to try to make happen and then uh, put a, a post about it. I guess I can create the live video many days beforehand, so it should show up in your subscription feed so you'll know, and maybe I'll, you know, tweet about it or something like that to give some people notice. Because live Q&A vlogs are fun. It just, you know, again, I, it keeps not making it. Um, speaking of not making it, um, I didn't get a uh, Games Radar vlog out last month. And again, I think part of the reason for that is because I've just been prioritizing other stuff. Um, also, you know, as I talked about in the last one of these update vlogs, I caught COVID, which really uh, knocked out like a week's worth of productivity. And then when you add on to that, uh, a week trip that I went where I was hypothetically doing work, but I didn't get as much done as I thought I would, it just left me feeling like I've been prioritizing other things, which is a bummer because I really like this vlog style content as well. I do like doing this kind of thing. So I'm really going to try to make that happen, get a Games Radar vlog out next month and uh, do a QA. and uh, Speaking of stuff that's been on my plate and part of the reason why I've been pushing some of these vlogs out is I've been doing a decent amount of development work, which is pretty cool. I went a couple of months not really doing any and then suddenly a whole bunch of stuff came in. <laughs> I'm working on uh, more rule books with uh, Thundergriff and I'm also um, doing some rule book work as well as actual game development work uh, with WizKids, um, which is totally new. I get that that um, that started with an email like four weeks ago, and and it's been really exciting um, doing the stuff, uh, working on a couple of different games, um, just working with new people. I really do enjoy all this development stuff. I just have to work it in with all of the videos and stuff that I'm also uh, needing to do. Um, there's another rule book on top of those other ones I've talked about that um, I really need to work on. I'm probably going to work on it later on tonight. <laughs> Actually, uh, that one's just a proofing thing. But as you can see. I've got quite a few things, you know, in the pot, <laughs> so to speak. And on top of that, you know, I am continuing to do these uh, playthrough with friends videos, which are not sponsored. And, and, you know, they take a decent amount of time. Um, I just posted to the uh, patrons a uh, early version of an Imperial Steam playthrough. I filmed that one last week with my friend Matt. Um, it's a lovely game that I kind of wanted to give more attention. So we played the full game. I, I edited it up. It's probably not going to go out for another week or two. I'll talk about that in the schedule section. But again, all patrons of the uh, Jongus Games Patreon campaign can watch that right now. But um, that video took me like nine hours, which is a lot. Like that's, you know, more than one standard work day. Um, and that wasn't sponsored in the slightest. That was more just, I wanted to do it. I want to keep making these videos. I enjoy making these videos. I enjoy playing these games and recording it and, and figuring all that kind of stuff out. So there's just a lot of, you know, time expenditure pressures going along. And uh, yeah, it's just a decent amount to balance. I'm not overly stressed. I had a bit of a stress spike last week, but I, I think I've largely gotten over it. Um, and looking forward for the next few weeks, I have a lot to do, but I don't think it's like a crazy amount. So hopefully I can work everything into the schedule. Either way, that was kind of a rambly, how's it going with John uh, segment. Um, as far as like my mental temperament and everything is concerned, I've had a great month. <laughs> I've had a really good time. Obviously going on a trip to see friends that I love is, is you know, a, a big factor in that. Also, I played a bunch of fun games. So there's a lot of good stuff going on. Either way, uh, let's now move into the shifting shelf segment where I talk about the new games that I've acquired over the last month and the games that I've removed to try and make room for these new games, but I'm still slipping backwards. The piles are huge. Um, anyway, there were seven new games that joined our collection last month, and let's talk about them briefly in alphabetical order. The first one is Anansi. Uh, this is a trick-taking game, a really funky trick-taking game, which is kind of must follow, but also has a shifting trump value and this thing where you bid on how many cards you're going to win, but you change it as the round goes on. The art is stunning, and I really enjoyed playing this one at the Portland Game Collective Convention, and um, I went out and bought a copy because of that. I haven't actually played my copy. It's still in shrink, but I'm looking forward to it. It's, it's a super smart trick taker that I talked extensively about in one of those opinions episodes. The next game that we acquired is Gypsy King. Uh, this game came out a while ago, and I had never heard of it before until 
until the Hidden Gems podcast talked about it a whole bunch. Uh, I've talked about them a few times in these update vlogs. It's one of my favorite board game podcasts right now, or podcasts in general. They like to talk about games that are overlooked or just that people never really talked about that much. And this looked like a really simple but interesting game that's almost like turn order the game where all about manipulating when you're going to be taking your next turn is how you're going to be getting points as you're putting these tokens down onto the board. I've been curious at tracking down a copy of this one ever since I uh, listened to that episode, which was like four months ago or something. And then Anastasia, my friend Anastasia, put in an order uh, from a store in Europe and asked me if there was anything I was curious about. And then I was pretty shocked to find that they had a shrink copy for a very reasonable price. So I had her put that onto the order. And there's a couple of the games I'll be talking about in a minute that were also added onto that order. Uh, so I haven't actually played this one yet, but I am really looking forward to it. It looks simple and weird and interesting, and hopefully it's fun. Uh, the next game that arrived is Hachi Train. Um, this is a game that uh, I probably have one of like 10 copies that are in the entirety of the United States at this point. I'm not trying to be a hipster about that. I'm just saying this is a really hard game to find, and it's one that I took uh, a chance on. Um, there's a game called Trick and Trade, which I'll just talk about right now that's also on the list, that I really wanted to buy. And you could only get it from Japan, and you can only get it with a freight forwarder in Japan. So I essentially paid a company in Japan to buy this game, uh, specifically uh, Trick and Trade, as well as Hachi Train and Nana. I'll just talk about all three of those games at once. Um, I, I hired a company in Japan to buy the games from another company in Japan that only shipped to companies in Japan, and then that company shipped it to me. So I essentially had to pay for shipping twice. Ultimately, I paid like $28 for each of these three games, which is a lot for these tiny card games, but they look super cool. And I really wanted to try Trick and Trade because it's a trick-taking style game that also has stock trading, or I guess cryptocurrencies in the theme, but it's a effectively stocks. So I really wanted to try that. And then while I was putting in that order, I also saw Hachi Train. This is a card shedding style game, which I love. And it seemed to be similar-ish to Scout. And I love Scout. So I took a chance on it. I, I thought it might be a little bit too simple. It might not actually be worth it. But, you know, I was already there. So I ordered a copy and I played it once and I really enjoyed it. Uh, in fact, um, just uh, yesterday, I guess I recorded like 15 minutes in one of my opinions episode talking about all the things I liked about this game that takes like two minutes to teach. It's incredibly simple. Um, so <laughs> I'm not going to talk about it more here. I will just say I played it once and I really enjoyed it. Um, and it's a lovely little card game. Um, Mask Men is another card game that I ordered. Uh, specifically, I wanted to buy Anansi that I talked about earlier, and I found a copy of it at the Board Game Geek store. And then I also saw that they had a copy of Mask Men, which is a card game I hadn't tried, but I'd heard really good things about. So I added that onto the order. I'm doing a lot of order adding, as you could tell. I like want one game and I end up with three. Um, and I've actually played Mask Man a couple of times last month. Um, I briefly mentioned that I, I, I considered this one to be the game of the month. It was a super cool game about trying to get rid of cards. It's a uh, Mexican luchador wrestling theme, and you are uh, trying to play these cards, but the value of the cards changes depending on how people have played cards. So kind of similar to Dickory, the value of the cards in your hand will change as the round goes on. But in Mask Man, it's more about a communal uh, uh, building out that um, structure. It's fully competitive, but based off of the actions of the players, you figure out which of the suits is stronger than others until the end of the round, and then you wipe it, and you play more cards. Also, Dickory is a two-player game, and Mask Men plays two to six players. I played it two players and five players, and I really enjoyed both of them. Uh, so yeah, I'm really glad I got that. Uh, next up is Mil Fiori. It was a Reiner Knizia design that came out at Essen last year. Um, it looked cool. Apparently, it's pretty simple about a bunch of different types of majorities. I heard good things about it, and again, kind of threw it onto that order with Gypsy King, along with a game called Strand Hunter. I'm just going to jump <laughs> out of alphabetical order here again. Uh, that was another game that I threw onto the order that I heard really good things about, and I have not tried. In fact, Mil Fiori and Strand Hunter are still in shrink, which is surprising. Uh, whenever new games arrive at the house, I usually open them up immediately. I I'm not one of those people who likes to leave games in shrink on the shelf, but I've had so much going on and so many games arrive that these are still sitting in shrink along with Gypsy King and Anansi. There's a lot of in shrink games in the collection right now. Uh, but uh, yeah, Mil Fiori, I really like Reiner Knizia games. I've heard good things. I really want to try this one. And Strand Hunter, um, well, I heard that it was uh, similar, if not better, than a game called Santiva, which I also got a couple of months ago, uh, which is kind of a push your luck. Uh, kind of mind reading game that I really liked. And Strand Hunter has this uh, theme of trying to build sandcastles on the beach as the ocean recedes. 
cards and you actually play with the box. You put the box in the middle of the table and the ocean is this cloth with a dowel in it and it actually moves away and you put these three-dimensional sandcastles down and then the ocean comes back in. I don't actually know the specifics of the rules. I haven't tried it just yet, but I love the toy factor and the uh, just the overall visual aesthetic of it. And I heard from people whose opinions I respect that it was fun. So that was, I guess, enough for me to throw it onto the order which is just, you know, another game that's here. Uh, so coming back to the list, um, uh, Nana. I mentioned that I threw that one onto the order with Trick and Trade. I haven't played this one just yet, but it is a incredibly adorable looking, very lightweight game that's essentially advanced Go Fish with some memory elements. Well, I guess there's memory elements in Go Fish as well. Um, I haven't played it yet. It looks fun. It looks like something you don't want to go into with high expectations of like a complex setting. I think this is just kind of like a, a card game where you're going to be flipping things over, making other people flip things over like Go Fish and laughing about it. Um, Go Fish can be fun in the right setting, and so I'm hoping that Nana is even more fun um, in uh, more settings, because it does have a couple more things going on to it. Next up is a game called Next Station London, and if I'm being honest with you, I forgot everything about this game. Uh, this was sent to me as a press copy, um, and I told the publisher that I was interested in it when they emailed me about it. I, I looked at the information. I thought it looked cool, but that was like a month ago or so, and I, I don't remember the specifics of it, so it's sitting amongst so many other games. I really do want to get that one out. I, I, I feel guilty and weird when I get free copies of games and then I don't actually get them played. That's just something I very much don't want to do, which is part of the reason why I actually say no to a lot of press copies because we already have so many games here. But either way, this one did look cool. So I want to crack the shrink open on that one, read the rules and see why I wanted to play that one and, and actually get that one played. Uh, so next up we have Strand Hunter, which I talked about already. And then <laughs> We have another game that I threw onto an order. Uh, that's Through the Ages, New Leaders and Wonders. Once again, I wanted to buy a Nancy and I was in the Board Game Geek store and then I saw this and I realized I never got around to buying this expansion. It came out like a couple of years ago. Through the Ages is a brilliant strategy game. I played it dozens of times and I mostly just got this to make sure I had it. Like it feels like the kind of thing where I might forget about it and then five years from now be like, oh yeah, I should go get it. And it costs like $100 or something like that. So it was a reasonable price. So I figured I have it now. I'm not even sure when I'm going to play through the ages next. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe I'll never get it played again. I, I love the game, but there's so many games to play. But it was just easy to add this onto the order because I wanted to make sure that I had this expansion because it seemed like a really good one for just, you know, mixing things up in this game that <laughs> I'm now wondering if I'm going to play again. I definitely want to get Through the Ages played again. I just need to, I think, make it happen when I have so many others that are uh, uh, pulling for my attention. Uh, finally, there's Trick and Trade. I talked about that one already. This is one of the ones that really pushed me to spend some money, get some freight forwarding going on, and get some games, um, uh, some of which I've already enjoyed. I played Trick and Trade once as well, and I thought it was incredibly smart, like a super cool trick-taking game. Honestly, after one play, it's jumped up to being one of my favorite trick-taking style games. As I mentioned before, it's a trick-taking game with stocks, but it also has this cool element of may follow and also the person who wins the trick isn't necessarily the person to lead the next trick. It's also a game where you always get something even if you played the worst card. It's just a super cool game, and I'm looking forward to playing that one more, as well as Anansi. Like, I, I went out and bought that one after playing it, so that was not even sight unseen. I, I enjoyed Anansi enough, so there's just a lot of games that I'd love to play, and I'm actively playing a lot of card games right now. So at this point, we can move into the games that have left the shelf. It looks like it is seven that I pulled off of the shelves and, and removed from the collection, which realistically just means they're in a pile here in the studio. I, I've been kind of lagging on getting some of these uh, posted up. Um, also, you know, every six months I sell games at a flea market, so we're kind of in the middle of one of those. Um, either way, uh, a couple of these games have been in the collection for a while. Um, it's getting tough to remove <laughs> games oftentimes. Uh, we have a relatively... Well, we have a 5x5 five five Calyx, which is not a relatively small shelf, but we try to keep things restricted to that, and another shelf which has card games on it, um, and we're definitely losing. We still have big piles of games. But um, the first game leaving is America. This is a trivia-style game about America. We've had it for, like, seven years or something like that. Um, we played it a few times. We had a lot of fun in certain settings. I'm not crazy about trivia games, but some people in our group are, so we kind of kept it in the collection for years with the um, expectation that it's a good game to play with certain people. But honestly, it's been years since we played it, and I really need to make space for these new games that are coming in that I like more. Um, Jessica likes this game more than I do, and you know it's our collection for sure, but she felt like it was time to move this one on as well. Uh, next up is Bridge City Poker. Uh, this is a card game that I got just a few months ago, kind of at the beginning of my falling down the card 
board game uh, rabbit hole that I seem to be going on. Um, this was the uh, first published design from uh, uh, Portland Games Collective. Um, it's a lovely card shedding game, but it just did not do enough compared to all these other card games that we're getting. Um, we've we've acquired a lot recently, and I just realized it, when it comes to a card shedding game, I don't think this one does enough compared to others that we already have in the collection. And I need to start culling that down because I don't want to be just a collector with like dozens and dozens of card games. Like if I don't see myself reaching for this one instead of other ones for the foreseeable future, I think it makes sense to remove it. And that's kind of where I landed with it. I played it once, I, I thought it was fine, but it didn't grab me the way something like Scout has or like Hachi Train or, or various other card shedding games. Uh, the next game leaving the collection is Concept. Another game that we've had for a very long time. I think we got this one back close to when it came out. We've we probably owned this for like eight or nine years. Um, I really enjoyed playing this game. It's a, it's a game where technically you can score points, but we never use the points. We just kind of considered it more of like a, a, a social, fun thing to do. It's a game that's all about trying to get everybody else to guess the clue. It's effectively 20 questions, the game, but instead of having 20 questions to ask, you put cubes down onto a board that shows like colors and shapes and concepts. That's why the game is called Concept, of course, and you just play until somebody figures it out. Uh, we've really enjoyed playing this game so many times. That's why it stuck around in the collection for so many years, but ultimately what I realized is I think now I would just always rather play So Clover or Wavelength, games that are different in their own ways, but similar enough in like the setting in which I would actually play them to the point where I just don't think it makes sense to keep concept around anymore. It, it, it had its time with us and we really enjoyed it, but we haven't pulled it off the shelf in many years. And I think that's because there's just other games close enough to that kind of fun factor that we're reaching for instead. The next game leaving is Goat and Goat. Uh, this is another one of those uh, many card games that I bought recently, although this one was a little bit before uh, I fell down this card game rabbit hole. Um, I've been curious to try this one for a couple of years. Uh, it got a little bit of buzz um, uh, on Twitter and whatnot like a year or two ago about being this super lightweight but really cute and fun card game about, you know, getting goats and playing goats. It has this concept where the number of cards no, no, no. It, the value of the card that you play dictates the number of cards that you pull into your hand, and you're trying to make sets with the cards that you play. Um, there's a whole bunch of ones, and then less twos, threes, and then all the way up to fives being rare. So if you play like a whole bunch of ones, you only draw one card back into your hand, so you don't have that much flexibility, versus if you play a five, you pull five cards back, which is good in this game because you're trying to get cards to make sets. I played it once. I thought it was fine, but wow, we have so many card games, and I just don't see myself coming to this one versus all those others. And even though it's a really tiny box, I, I just, I'm trying not to keep games in the collection just because they're small. Like, I, I just, I, I think it's very likely we'll never play this game again, and because of that, we're moving it on. Uh, next up is Hanami Koji. This is a, another small-ish, it's a bigger box, but it's still a small game. It's a two-player only, uh, it's a really funky game. I made a video for it a very long time ago. That's actually why I have it. I, I did a sponsored video for this one way back when I first do started doing sponsored videos. And if I remember correctly, it's a game all about trying to figure out what your opponent is going to be doing. I don't remember all the rules exactly, but this is a two-player only game that has not been pulled off the shelf in probably six or seven years. It's not a huge box, but again, I think it's time to move it on. Um, we've got a lot of two-player games, and I didn't even throw this into my suitcase when I went specifically to a setting where I knew I was going to play two-player games for two days straight. Well, if I'm not bringing this one, then I think that maybe means it's time to move this one on. Um, next up, we have Juicy Fruits. This is honestly a really lovely game. I, I did a sponsored video for it last year. Uh, it uses that concept of sliding uh, puzzles of like, you know, parking lot puzzles of like moving cars around in a grid to get other things out. Um, and in this game, it's kind of a Euro version of that, where you have these tokens that you're moving and the farther you move them and the more resources you get, and then you can spend those resources in order to free up locations on your island to be able to move things around even more. It's honestly a really smart game. I think it's a really good game, but I need to make some hard cuts. Like I've enjoyed playing this one a couple of times, but it's like a ticket to ride style box. It's definitely not small. I'm not saying it's too big for what it is, but what it is is a game that I have a hard time seeing coming off the shelf with so many other games that we're reaching for. I feel like this is a really fun game that deserves to be in someone else's collection where it'll actually get played more. Um, so yeah, uh, I feel bad pulling this one off because it is fun and I honestly would not mind playing it more in the future, but we just need the space and I have to be realistic about the odds of it actually being played now that I've, you know, played it a couple of times before. Um, you know, the amount of times that we actually sit down to play games is still relatively restricted and I think that's definitely one of the factors that's going through my head. 
Finally, there's Wormholes. Uh, I got sent a press copy of this one from AEG just a couple of months ago. I was really interested in it because I like the concept. It's a pick up and deliver game with wormholes. So you have a hex grid and you're like teleporting through space, essentially using these wormholes. You're putting wormholes down like crazy. So the idea is that you move a little bit and then you can kind of jump through a wide um, network of these wormholes, both yours and your opponents. And every time you use your opponents, you give them a point. I thought the idea of this sounded like a lot of fun. So I asked for a press copy of it. The problem is that, um, well, I got it and I played it once and it kind of didn't go very well. Uh, I had an okay time with it. My opponent did not have very much fun at all. It really seemed like luck of the cards was, uh, luck of the draw of the cards that we were taking seemed to be a dominant factor. And again, we only played it once. So I don't want to sit here and say the game's imbalanced or anything like that. But what I can say is the first impression was pretty lackluster. And when we are just getting buried in games that I actively want to play, I really don't see myself coming back to this one. And I, again, I feel like it's a bit unfair to the game because in particular, we played it at two players and I strongly feel like it would be better with more players because there's just going to be more wormholes out there to jump through. So you're going to have less turns that are like kind of lackluster and maybe the the way the cards will get uh, dealt out to the players will make it feel a little bit less swingy. It just seemed like I kept drawing the perfect card and my opponent kept not drawing the perfect card and I won in a blowout and I didn't even feel that much ownership of the win, if that makes sense. So again, it feels a little unfair to the game that is probably a lot more fun at higher player counts and I could probably have a lot more fun playing it more in the future. But first impressions can be important. And when there's just so many games for us to choose from in our collection, I think it makes sense to move this one on. Um, I do think that this is a game for some people. It just didn't seem to be necessarily a game for me. So hopefully it can find a collection that will enjoy it more than it seems like we did. So yeah, that is going to bring a pretty long shifting shelf segment to a close. I feel like I talked about those games more than I usually do. Uh, anyway, that's going to bring us to the final segment of this episode where we talk about the upcoming videos. So this is just my current plan for the videos that are going to be coming out over the next four or so weeks. And so uh, looking to next week, which is week 36, um, the first video coming out is Rise and Fall. Um, this is a, a video that I've actually finished like last week. It's, it's totally done. It's a really neat game. I actually played this one um, in my two-player Crazy Con day uh, with my friends specifically because the game looked weird and I wanted to play it before I filmed a video. I almost never play games before I film sponsored videos, but this was one of those cases where I felt like I, I really wanted to. A, because it looked interesting, and B, because I didn't want to show the game off poorly, and it seemed like the kind of game that I, I needed to kind of see how it actually played to really see how it played, if that makes sense. Um, it's a pretty rules streamlined game of um, area acquisition and kind of tech trees, and uh, it also has this world building thing, which is just completely cool, where before you start playing the game, everybody together constructs the world, placing all these tiles down. I really highlighted that in the video because I wanted people to see it because that is so satisfying, like before you even start playing the game. Anyway, I'm gushing about it a little bit. That is a sponsored video, so take my opinion with a grain of salt, but I really enjoyed playing that game and it was fun to make the video for that one. Um, th uh, the next day after that, I'm going to be putting out a video for Merchant's Cove, uh, specifically the Mastercrafts expansion. Um, that's going to be a little bit different of a video. Um, normally, I do tutorials where I kind of teach the game while it's being played, but I've already made one of those for Merchant's Cove. So this is going to be more of a teaching overview video where I teach uh, or I give an overview teaching style uh, for each of the new uh, characters that are getting added into the game as well as another expansion module. So it's going to be kind of an, an overview style video, and that's uh, next up on the docket. I'm going to be working on that right after this video. Uh, let's see. Also that week, I'm going to be putting out a video for Morpho, which is a game that I wasn't sure I'd be able to cover at first because it's a deduction style game. It's not really social deduction. In fact, it's, it's not actually social deduction. It's more trying to deduce what people's hidden roles are based off of their actions, not what they're saying with their words. Um, it's got a decent amount of variety and like a really tiny package. Uh, it's for a company I've worked for before. This is a sponsored video and I finished the video. That one's completely done and it's hanging out unlisted on YouTube, ready to uh, uh, go live alongside, I believe the release or a Kickstarter campaign, something like that. Um, either way, that's going to be the third video coming out next week. Uh, looking to the week after that, um, planning on putting out the Imperial Steam playthrough with friends video. I mentioned that earlier that it's actually literally done. Uh, I posted it to the Patreon supporters of the channel. They got to access to that one free. They get to watch it without advertisements and stuff. And uh, because next week's schedule is pretty full with three videos already, I don't think I want to add a fourth video onto it. So I'm going to push Imperial Steam off until week 37, at least for non-patrons of the channel. Um, and that was just a full playthrough that I played with my friend Matt. It's a, it's a really cool game. Um, that was not a sponsored 
video. I did do a sponsored tutorial uh, for uh, uh, Imperial Steam last year, but but this one wasn't sponsored. Uh, let's see. Also that week, uh, in week 37, I'm planning on putting out a sponsored tutorial for Shapers of Gaia. Uh, this is a, I think, two- or three-player-only game coming out from WizKids. It's here in the room. Uh, I just haven't read the rules to it yet. I, I got an overview of it, like, nine months ago or something when I had a meeting with WizKids, and I thought it sounded really cool. So I'm looking forward to digging into that one and remembering why I thought that one seemed really cool. But anyway, that one's uh, going to be coming out in a couple of weeks. Also in week 37, potentially, I'll be putting out a sponsored video for Tylatum. That is probably not how it's pronounced. I'm not really sure, but this is the next uh, medium to heavyweight. I'm not actually sure how heavy it is. Uh, Euro game coming out from Board and Dice. Um, supposedly, that is on the way to my house. I haven't received it yet, but it should be arriving soon. And they wanted uh, that video to come out as soon as possible. And I think it's likely as soon as possible is going to end up being week 37. So we'll just see how that goes. Then looking forward to week 38. Uh, this is the week that I'm thinking I'm going to do a uh, live questions and answers vlog. Uh, as I mentioned this earlier on in this episode, I I'm not going to pinpoint a specific day and a specific time now. It's three weeks out, and you know, if the last couple months are anything to go off of, I might actually miss that time. So I don't really want to uh, throw people off with uh, misinformation. So yeah, I, I hope to make an announcement about that and, and post the link to it like a couple days before, uh, and hopefully I'll put that one out um, next week. It's been three months since I've done one of these, so I really do want to make sure it happens that week. Um, also that week, I'm planning on putting out a sponsored video for Nightmare Productions, um, which I don't remember much about. I know this is a Reiner Knizia game. It's kind of a re-theme, redo of another game that he did, and the name is flying out of my brain. I'll put it down here on screen. Uh, so I'm going to do a sponsored video for that one that week. Um, and also potentially that week, I'll do a sponsored video for a game called Dice Conquest, which is this small game coming out from WizKids. Um, it's got dice in a variety of different shapes, just like uh, Shapers of Gaia. I thought it sounded neat 10 months ago, but I don't remember the details of it. Um, so looking to week 39, the last week of the month, um, that's when I really, really am going to try to put out a games radar vlog. I missed last month, so this is going to be two months worth of stuff, and there are a lot of announcements and just a lot of interesting games uh, coming out right now. So I don't want to go too long, and that's probably going to be a pretty big episode because I missed this window. Um, part of me thought about doing one of these Games Radar vlogs now-ish anyway, but as you can see, my, the schedule for the next few weeks is already pretty full, so I think I kind of missed my shot on that one. Um, also, that week, I'm planning on putting out a video for Beastery of Sigillum, and I know I'm a bit of a broken record, but this is another one of those games that I thought looked cool, like a month ago or two months ago when they reached out to me about it, and um, I just there's so many games that I'm learning about every day that I've kind of forgotten the details of this one, but that's going to be a sponsored video coming out in the last week of the month. So yeah, that is what the next month is looking like. It's very likely that some of this is going to be wrong. <laughs> Things might get shuffled around, and uh, who knows, there might be surprise videos that show up as well. I'm not really sure. Uh, but either way, I think that is going to uh, bring us to the end of this update vlog. I feel like I, I talked a surprising amount, <laughs> considering when I started this off, I didn't think I was going to have that much to say. Like, sometimes I'm like, oh, I bought this new equipment, or oh, this one particular thing that was really cool happened this month. Uh, maybe I'm just in a really talkative mood today. But either way, I hope you enjoyed this episode, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to bring this one to a close. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos just like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, then please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.